candidates, educate yourselves, and be informed voters when it comes to the March 1st primary election. I, I really appreciate y'all showing up. I'm Deborah Frank. I'm the Fayette County Republican Party Chairman. And um, again, I just thank you for being here. We're going to start off with invocation. So if you will stand for the invocation in the Father, we repent our sins and the sins of our leaders. We ask you to forgive our leaders for broken promises and hardened hearts toward people in America and elsewhere. Forgive the lies of our leaders. Forgive us for electing ungodly, dishonorable leaders to rule our nation and for allowing those who not truly elected to rule. Corruption abounds in our government. Please forgive us and deliver us. Father, situations on earth seem hopeless, but this isn't true. We can ask you for miracles, and we can expect them. We pray for our brothers and sisters in America and in the world. We pray for American citizens, government workers, missionaries, and those in our military efforts. Extend your grace to them, Lord. And Father, we ask for the great harvest of souls to continue. We ask for it to be many millions a stunning revival. We ask for this in other nations as well. Please continue exposing the evil in our government. Please send America the greatest revival in our history. May it see what we could even ask or pray for. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, now the pledges start with the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. I am the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one Anybody else? 
audience that's not part of the, the two forums? Oh, Jane Morell, she is running for Justice of the Peace in Precinct 2. Did I miss anybody? Okay, good. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. The restrooms are in that little hallway there. Uh, the bar is open if you want to order drinks. They will also, um, you can order from a limited menu, so you're welcome to do that. Um, what else? When you came in, you should have been given a little flyer that gives all of the information for the March 1st elections, all the polling locations, uh, early voting, and the rest of our forums. We're going to have three more forums after that, but so be sure you pick up a flyer that has all of that information. Also, when you signed in, you should have been given, if you wanted, an index card that you could write questions for the candidates. After we go through the first 10 questions for each candidate, then we'll take a brief intermission, we'll collect the audience questions, and then we'll ask those. So you will have an opportunity uh, to have your question heard if the issue isn't addressed prior to that. I want to thank our moderator, Dennis Giesemann from Flatonia, his assistant moderator, Frank Horstier from the Eagle Area, our timekeeper is Barbara Apelt, also from Eagle Area. Uh, our security <coughs> is County Constable of Precinct 4, Jason Strickland, back there in the corner. And big kudos to uh, David Stahl, our sound manager. I really appreciate all his help uh, in overseeing all the audio equipment today. Uh, Andy Bailin is also here from the Fayette County Record. Andy is going to be live streaming these forums for us. And um, they'll be live streamed on the Fayette County, <laughs> Fayette County Record uh, website, right? Facebook, Facebook. page. <clears throat> okay, Facebook page. And then later posted <clears throat> to YouTube. To YouTube. Okay, thanks, Andy. And then we also have Melissa Berger here. She's a reporter for the Platonia Argus and the Schulberg Sticker. So thank you all both for being here and covering these forums. Uh, last but not least, uh, Kimberly Rutledge is our Fayette County Republican Party treasurer. So, if anybody would like to make a free do donation to help uh, support these forums that we're putting on, or our party in general, feel free to give your money to Kimberly. So, that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Dennis Giesemann. He will go over the rules for the candidates. Well, folks, I have to start off with. Uh, Wait, was there a question? Can we also say thank you to the Singleman Hall that I guess keeps building? Absolutely. I'm, thank you for reminding me. Thank you to Singleman Hall who let us use this building at no charge. We really appreciate it. Then we have to start off with some housekeeping at first, uh, uh, we can call it instructions. So I'll read through a few of those. The candidates are to focus their responses on their own experience and qualifications for the office they are seeking. Candidates uh, should not disparage any other candidate. If a candidate makes a disparaging remark about another candidate, they will be removed from the tables for the remaining four. Each candidate will have three minutes for an opening remark, one and a half minutes response time for a question, and two minutes for closing remarks. All candidates will be given, given the opportunity to answer each question. Candidates should only respond to those questions that are asked. If they go off topic, moderators should stop them and move on to the next candidate or question. Initial questions will be addressed to the candidates in ballot order. Each subsequent question will initially be directed to the next candidate on ballot order so that every candidate will have uh, periodically have a question directed to them first. So now, if, if it's all right, uh, I can call you uh, uh, Stephen and Drew. Okay, um, we'll start off with a three minutes opening remarks, starting with Stephen. Not good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Matula, and I am seeking the position of Fayette County Commissioner of Precinct 4. I was born and raised here in Fayette County, namely Schulenburg. Uh, by the late John and Annie Matula. Uh, went to 
School at St. Rose along with Schoenberg ISD. Uh, my wife Lisa, who's sitting over there, uh, and I have two daughters, uh, Dr. Amber Matula and Heather Matula. Uh, they're both out of school already and, and out in their own lives. We raised our girls here with the upbringing and values of church, community, honesty, uh, common sense, hard work, and small town values. We are parishioners at St. Rose Lima Catholic Church, uh, and in our spare time, enjoy spending time with family and friends, working with my wife, taking care of our small cattle operation, riding tractors, cutting hay, baling hay, uh, along with taking family and friends fishing and hunting. Uh, my civic activity, activities through the years, uh, volunteering at numerous church picnics, uh, in the past, I've served as a volunteer fireman here in Schulenburg. Uh, been a member and officer with the Schulenburg Young Farmer Chapter. Been a member and officer with the Schulenburg Junior Livestock Show. And a member and served on the Board of Directors of the Fayette County Fair. Thank you. All right, Drew, you have to Hello, I'm Drew Grossman. I'm Drew Grossman, your current Fayette County Precinct 4 Commissioner. I have lived and worked in Fayette County all of my life. My wife, Carrie, and I have two sons, Bo and Brody. Today is actually Brody's seventh birthday, so happy birthday, son. We live just south of Schoenberg in the St. John area. As your county commissioner for the past year, I've learned that it's not all about building roads. While that is a certainly an important part of it, but it's only a small portion of what we do. It is the responsibility of the commissioner's court to man maintain the county budget and to make sure that there is no wasteful spending. We have to make hard decisions that demand standing your ground and doing what is right for Fayette County, not only for the present, but into the future. I believe two of the strongest assets I bring to this position are my experience and my work leadership. I'm a hands-on leader that sets the tone for our crew by my work ethic. There's not a piece of equipment on our yard that I do not know how to operate. For my team, that means a great deal. They know I understand what they are doing and what it takes to operate that piece of equipment. I know the frustration and sense of accomplishments for a job well done. It is a work ethic and respect we share as a team together. I have the experience and the knowledge on how to build solid, long-lasting, affordable roads for your tax dollars, how to maintain our equipment, and how to get the longevity out of our equipment. The most important, the most important part is I know how to listen to my constituents. I went to work for the city of Schoenberg right out of high school. During my 11 and a half years there, I obtained several different licenses which have helped me prepare for some of the issues Fayette County faces today. I was hired on at Fayette County Road and Bridge Department in 2012. In 2015, Commissioner Moros appointed me to the superintendent's job. Moros provided me the opportunity to learn from the beginning. I worked hands-on on all projects that we completed, and I also was the main motor grader operator, delegating the crew their daily objectives making sure jobs are done in a timely fashion, and meeting with customers about complaints and roadway issues. It was during this time I learned all the ins and outs of Precinct 4. When Commissioner Moros retired at the end of 2020, Judge Weber appointed me to the rest of the term because he said I was the most qualified candidate. Since taking over, we have made huge strides for Precinct 4 in Fayette County. Over the past year serving as your commissioner, I have shown that I am the right commissioner for the future of Fayette County and Precinct 4. I will always put the taxpayers first and continue to make sure that I am the voice of the people. We have made, uh, we have completed 13.58 miles of road improvements. We have cleaned out almost five miles of fence line and reshaped ditches. And we have land that was donated to Fayette County for the new EMS station for Fayette County Precinct 4, which will help us with our growth in the future. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go through a series of ten questions where you each have a minute and a half to uh, respond, and uh, uh, some of that may be a little bit repetitive, but I'll start off with the first question here for Drew. How familiar are you with the responsibilities of the County Commissioner, and what experience has provided you with this familiarity? Uh, I am very familiar with the responsibilities. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, that a lot of people think that the Fayette County Commissioner's job is just to go in and make sure that you build the correct roads. That's just a very, very small portion. We are the stewards of the Fayette County taxpayer dollars. We are in charge of the budget. We are there to make sure that there's no wasteful spending. Uh, we oversee all of the spending throughout all of Fayette County. Uh, 
my experiences over the past year, and then also as the superintendent under Commissioner Moros, I have uh, experience in this area. Uh, working over the budget this past year, uh, all the commissioners were in depth, and we had hands on and put a lot of time and uh, effort and uh, hours into to make sure that all the money goes to the grant departments and it has been a useful way for the taxpayers to pay account. Okay, same question for Stephen. How familiar are you with the responsibilities of the county commissioner and what experience has provided you with that familiarity? Uh, having not served as county commissioner before, but being familiar with the roles and responsibilities, a county commissioner, you're responsible for serving on the commissioner's court, uh, and, at the, and at, in that position, the commissioner court exercises broad policy making authority. Uh, they represent the precinct that they are elected to, uh, responsible for the building and maintenance of all county assets, be it uh, county buildings, vehicles, uh, courthouse, uh, bridges, uh, vehicles and equipment. Uh, they are also responsible for the county budget and tax rate, approval of budgeted purchases. They set salar salaries and benefits for the county employees. Uh, they also authorize contracts for different services for the county. Okay, second question, Stephen. Explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and our licenses will make you the best candidate to serve as county commissioner. Uh, after graduating in 1986 from Schulenburg, went to Glenn College for one year. Uh, in 87, the summer of 87, became a summer employee for TxDOT. 71 bypass was being built around the range. Uh, in August, instead of returning back to college, I signed, hired on as an inspector, uh, figuring to go back to college one of the after I put some money in the bank. Uh, ended up staying there, became, uh, moved around from construction, uh, maintenance, did operations, learned. Uh, I enjoyed the work making a difference for the people of the county and the state, uh, overseeing construction projects, patching bottles, seal coating, cleaning ditches. Whatever it took, I was willing to do it. Uh, also including uh, emergency responses, uh, be it incidents, flooding, the act of God. Uh, became a supervisor in Colorado County in 1999, uh, served there as three years uh, as a maintenance supervisor over all of Colorado County, came back to Fayette County in 2002, uh, supervisor of Tech Stop in Fayette County. Uh, in those duties, scheduling road work, meeting with citizens, listening to concerns, listening to problems, uh, addressing issues as, as we could. Uh, at this time, I'm still employed with Tech Stop. Uh, evaluating roads across the whole state of Texas, so I see a lot of different things, uh, different things that affect everyone. Thank you. Okay, same question for Drew. Explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and or licenses will make you the best candidate to serve as county commissioner. Sure, it's my time with the city of Schulenburg. I obtained uh, several licenses. The license that I had was a D water distribution, C groundwater operator, uh, backflow preventer assembly tester, and a class A CDL. Uh, while my time was there, I learned how to operate all the equipment we also had in the city yard. When I came to the county, uh, I was there for a short amount of time before Commissioner Morris supported me to the superintendent position. At that time, I was uh, the main man on the road crew. I was in charge of all the projects to oversee them, make sure they're done in a timely fashion. Uh, the the main experience with building roads and, and throughout Fayette County is that you have to learn all the roads that we have to take care of. That's the biggest part. You know, you have to know what areas flood, what areas are prone to flood, what areas we still need to do work in and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we've been, so far since I've been there, we've made it through the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the freeze, uh, the COVID and everything. And through all this, nothing has stopped us. We've still been able to do our job continuously day in and day out. Uh, I think that says a lot about my leadership skills and the crew that I have developed there. I have some, assembled an awesome working crew. Uh, they are one of a kind and the knowledge and projects uh, that they are able to finish within the county and saving the taxpayers money by being able to do this in-house. It's just unbelievable. Okay, Drew, right back to you with uh, number three. What are your current sources of income and if elected, will you continue them? If so, how will it affect your ability to perform, to perform your duties as county commissioner? Uh, the sources of income 
what we have, uh, myself being the county commissioner, my wife works for uh, Hallettsville for the Walker Medical Center, and besides that, we have a cat alongside that we raised, me and my family. Uh, besides that, there's all the income that we have, and we have plenty of free time. We go ahead and take care of all the constituents and all the problems that we have. See for you, what are your current sources of income, and if elected, will you continue them? If so, how will it affect your ability to perform your duties as county commissioner? Um, working for TxDOT, uh, my wife works for the USPS as a rural letter carrier. Uh, run cattle on the side, do a little bit of custom hay work, uh, custom fencing, whatever, custom weld. So that's pretty much it. Okay. All right, Stephen, right back to you. In order of importance, what are the three most challenging responsibilities of the county commissioner position? I would say budgeting, uh, setting the tax rate budget for the county uh, would probably be at the top of the list. Making sure all the programs, benefits that the citizens of Bay County uh, have that they are covered. Uh, tax rate, keeping it. Uh, as low as possible. I know there's a lot of uh, things inside that budget with the tax rate that fall into it. Uh, that land values, uh, uh, home values keep rising, the inflation rates are going up. So even without raising tax rates, you bring in more money uh, through different things. That's going to be the first. Second is quality of roads and bridges. Uh, Every day people get in a vehicle, travel somewhere, need to go, emergency services, need to roll, uh, roads and bridges. Uh, liability to the county is probably my last one. Uh, a lot of things out there, signs, uh, delineators, uh, important liability claims across the state have gone up. Not only for state roads, county is just as liable. More and more people are moving into the county. Uh, with that, you can increase that uh, chance of something coming back onto the county. Thank you. Okay, who are the reports for the three most challenging responsibilities of the county commissioner's position? One of the most challenging things so far has probably been to decide on the payroll and the, uh, the benefits for your employees to make sure that you take care of the people who are serving the citizens of the state county. If you take care of your employees, you have good employees, uh, happy employees. They do great things for Fayette County and they can continue to help us try to uh, lead Fayette County into the future. Uh, the other thing, also like uh, Stephen said, was the tax rate. You know, everything in the world is going up. Uh, you know, the way the government is going down, it's, it's, it's going down you know, as fast as it uh, For us to be able to keep the tax rate low for our uh, citizens is amazing. And the, able, the way that we're able to do that is by the growth that we have in the county, the amount of people coming in, the businesses we have coming in. That's the revenue that we're able to keep continuing into the future to where we can keep the tax rate the same. Uh, other thing is the infrastructure. We have to make sure through growth that we handle the infrastructure. You have to make sure you have your roads, your bridges, your EMS department, your fire department, your sheriff's department to cover all the growth that's coming into Fayette County. That's the three most important things right now. Okay, Drew, right back to you. As county commissioner, how do you plan to be readily accessible to your constituents? I am, ever since I've taken over in January, I've always had an open door and one phone call away policy. Uh, all the cards that I hand out to people whenever I first meet them, it has my personal cell phone, my work cell phone, my home number, and everything, my emails. I'm very readily and easily to get a hold of them throughout the community at several different events. You see me talking to people at the grocery store, at Walmart, or wherever. It doesn't bother me. Being a commissioner is a full-time, 24-7 job. It's not just an 8 to 5. So when people approach me at any time throughout the day, weekend, whenever, I'm always there for you to listen to your concerns and see if we can come up with a solution again. Okay, Stephen, for you as county commissioner, how do you plan to be readily accessible to your constituents? Uh, kind, of, kind of following up what Drew had to say, we live in a world of modern technology. Cell phone uh, is pretty much with me 24-7. Uh, through my years of experience and, and my past job, I've always believed in open door policy. Stop by, walk in, there's no closed door, you can get a hold of me, holler at me, like Drew said, catch me, at, you see me at church, you see me at grocery store, picnics, 
you know, I'm always there to listen. It's, it's uh, being a public servant is a 24-hour job. So uh, email is another great option tool out there. Uh, but yes, it, it's there. I've done that for 33 plus years and, and listen to any problems, comments. Uh, I always said that our local people, uh, my employees, I would tell them, you're the ones when you do a job wrong out on the road, you're going to run into that person at church or out there at the grocery store and say, why did y'all do that? So just make sure you're responsible and, and um, like I said, always answer the phone. Not a problem. Return the phone call. Thank you. Okay, Steve. And for you, in your opinion, what could be done to mitigate the county's expense to repair damages to our county roads by oil field companies and 18 wheeler traffic in general? Uh, kind of some of the. That, that was to me, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I know there was some inspections of roads that went on when the energy sector hit in Eagleford. Uh, having a good documentation of how the road was beforehand, uh, having pictures, whatever, a file of it, you're able to take that after the damage is done. Uh, also doing permitting for oversized, overweight trucks, trailers, whatever, going down those low volume roads, county roads. Uh, uh, setting up, probably working with the uh, county uh, judge's office and uh, county attorney to figure out what kind of other options are out there. But uh, in my past experience, that's one of the ways to do it. Okay, for Drew, in your opinion, what could be done to mitigate the county's expense to repair damages to our county roads by oil food companies and 18 wheeler traffic in general? We actually have a policy in place right now whenever oil field comes in or, or gas pipelines or anything like that they, they go in they sign a road bond agreement where whenever they come in the way the road is that day whatever they destroy they're going to lock for they're not allowed to go ahead and sign off on that bond agreement until the commissioner is okay so therefore the the amount of especially on the northern end of the county the amount of uh, oil and gas pipelines that are going in up there the amount of destruction that they're doing to the roads they are paying for we have several roads that we've had in the precinct four, Pedrano Shea Loop being one of them. They put in a new oil pad, destroyed the whole road going all the way to the oil pad. As soon as it was over, the oil company paid for all of the limestone to go in and haul it all out. So we were able to redo it, have a brand new road that will last for years to come. So we do hold those companies to the fire. We make them pay for it to where it's not on the back of the constituents to pay county taxpayers to pay for the oil and gas growth. The companies are paying for themselves in the long run. Okay, next question back for Drew. Are you in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by Governor Abbott during the past two years? If so, identify the lawful justification for that. You know, the past year was all over the place. This is something that nobody's ever been through before. This is completely new charter territories. Some of the things that Governor Abbott handed down, uh, you know, the, the short-term mask mandates and stuff like that, you know, I, I'm not one for government to go ahead and tell you what to do in your personal lives. I'm not a doctor. You know, everybody has their own physician. If you look in your own household today, just you and your family, look at the different medical conditions you have in your own small household. How can you have one single rule that can go all the way across the board for everybody to follow and be strict on that? And then, so, you know, I'm all about freedom of choice. Uh, I'm all about the conservative values and stuff like that to where you should have the right to decide what you need to do and what you need to do to keep yourself, your family, and your body safe. Uh, the, the vaccine mandates and, and all the other stuff that you're talking about, once again, we're not doctors. We're, we are here just to go ahead and take care of the strict county stuff that we should. Your roads, your taxes, we're not in charge of your health care and what you need to do for your own personal. Okay, Christina, are you in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by Governor Abbott during the past two years? If so, identify the lawful justification for that. I agree that each individual should have the right to make their own decision. Uh, at times, the uh, major uh, illnesses or uh, pandemics like what went on, sometimes it is, it, it is necessary to enforce something. But 
for the health of the public because you still oversee that. As far as at the county level uh, and even at the state, I still agree it's, it's our own given right to uh, decide if we want to get vaccinated, decide if we don't, decide if we want to wear a, a face mask uh, in that part. But for the good of all mankind, uh, not having been through a pandemic like this in our time, uh, some of y'all here may have been through that, uh, some of the different uh, measles or different things years ago, uh, hemorrhagic fever, I think that was all before our time. But uh, I agree to a point with it, but not wholeheartedly, because it's still every individual's choice and given rights for the country that we live in. Okay, Stephen, back at you. Do you believe that, that more citizens should be actively involved in local politics and the decisions that affect them and their children? If so, what could you do as county commissioner to encourage your constituents to become more involved? Uh, first thing, March 1st, we have a, there's an election coming up. Get out there and vote. Uh, get informed about everybody that's running for different offices. Uh, be involved with community uh, commissioner's court, uh, county judges, different uh, things. Stay informed. Read. Uh, there's a lot of information out there between Mr. Balin with the Bay County Record, Latonia, Argus. You know, stay informed. Uh, I'm probably getting off track. Here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the biggest thing is, is our given right, uh, the country that we live in, to go and vote. Uh, that's the smallest part you can do. Uh, get informed about the, the candidates for the different positions and, and do your part. Thank you. Okay, for you, do you believe that more citizens should be actively involved in local politics and the decisions that affect them and their children? If so, what could you do as county commissioner to encourage your constituents to become more involved? Absolutely, they should be involved. Uh, it's their tax dollars that are going toward all the programs that we have in Fayette County. Uh, and if you have children, you really want to be involved because you want Fayette County to be going in the right direction for your kids. You know, we're never, none of us are going to be here forever. And you want to leave the world a better place than the way you found it, especially for your children and the people of the future. So it is important for the uh, citizens of Fayette County. There's many different uh, avenues to where they can keep up with county politics, what's going on on the daily level. Uh, you know, the county website, we have all the documents online, uh, all the commissioner courts, everything that we discuss, all the documents, you can go right online. You know, I know we have a commissioner courts during the day when everybody's working and everybody cannot attend. I completely understand that. But there is ways for you to get out there and look at the information. Keep yourself informed. If you don't like what's going on, contact your commissioner, contact your judge, contact your JPs, whoever your elected officials are. That is the voice of the community. That's the people who are representing you in Fayette County. Uh, you know, every vote is important. The, the primary election is coming up. You know, if you want things done a certain way, if you want things to change, or if you like the way they are, if that candidate is saying something that you like, you need to go out and you need to vote for them. Because if you do not vote, it's nobody's fault but your own. If those people aren't in the right positions to go ahead and take that county into the future. Okay, Drew, back at you. What changes or improvements would you focus on to positively guide the future of Precinct 4 and Fayette County in general? You know, we're actually doing some of those changes right now for the future. Uh, we have the land that was donated to Fayette County for the new EMS station here for Precinct 4. That's going to help us handle the growth into the future. You know, uh, it'll be a nicer facility to be able to uh, have an extra squad unit in the future, possibly. Uh, the other things that we've been doing is uh, at Flatonia, we're also upgrading that EMS facility. We're adding another EMS facility in Round Top Warrington area. Uh, that's some of the things that we have there. But, uh, other stuff uh, is with the sheriff's department. You know, the sheriff's department, they have a job like none other nowadays. The way that the media and everybody has portrayed them, the, uh, the grief that they have put up with, and it, it's, it's the tools that they do and the amount that they do and the way that they keep the citizens safe, the amount of drugs that they're taking off the streets in Fayette County, the amount that they get through the forfeiture fund, the amount of money that they save for the Fayette County taxpayers, that's something we need to make sure that we continue into the future. Um, 
That would be about it for right now. Okay. For Stephen, what changes or improvements would you focus on to positively add the future of Precinct 4 and 5th County in general? Kind of following along, uh, roads and bridge improvement, of course. I, that's part of the job uh, as commissioner. Uh, some areas that I visited had some drainage improvement issues that probably need to take place. Uh, water gets underneath your road, your road deteriorates a whole lot quicker. Uh, less potholes, less base failures, uh, along with the need for quality equipment and facilities for all uh, county offices, be it the, the precincts, be it the sheriff's department, uh, EMS, uh, same thing, facilities and, and better equipment. Uh, better traffic control devices. Uh, I think I touched on it a while ago in another question, signs delineation. Uh, with the growth that is happening, the county risk of tort and liability claims will go up. You've got a stop sign out there that you can't read. Uh, a good lawyer gets a hold of that. It's an issue for the county. Uh, having better signs, traffic control devices, lowers the risk for these types of claims. Uh, responding to the daily calls and concerns of the citizens of the county. Uh, especially Precinct 4 uh, would be at the top of my priorities along with the safety of county employees and the citizens of the county. Thank you. Okay, back at you, Stephen. Last question in this segment. In the past decade, there have been a large influx of people moving from the urban areas in Texas as well as from out of state into uh, Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth? And and ideas that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town values. That's a tough one. Uh, I've witnessed it across uh, being in my past, uh, in, in my current job, uh, seeing that the urban metro areas are growing. Uh, the people are wanting to get out of that type of life. They're moving to the country. How do we limit it? It's probably the million dollar question. Uh, we have a great way of life. They come in, they see Fayette County, they see the, the beautiful uh, areas we have, the rolling hills, the trees, and they want to get out of that concrete infested <coughs> jungle. Uh, they're coming out here. How do we, the best we can do, I guess, is with the tax, tax dollars that we have, try to maintain the infrastructures that we do have. Uh, I can't say there's a true way, the way you can uh, but take care of the citizens that are here. Uh, keep hometown common sense goals and values. Thank you. Okay, Drew, in the past decade, there's been a large influx of people moving from urban areas in Texas as well as from out of state into Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town values? You know that's that's very it's a very tough line to follow there because you know we need growth we need we need people coming in here to continue to build and make our community a better place. Uh, the good thing about having people come in, build homes, uh, you know, and helps helps with the tax revenue. That's what helps keep our tax rates low. The more tax revenue we have, your tax rate stays the same. Uh, that being said, of course, everybody doesn't want us all jam packed like they are in the city, 100 percent. And the reason why those people are coming here is because of the way that we run Fayette County. Uh, it's because of the way that our schools are. It's our small town community. It's the way that the county makes sure that we have the proper services for these people. That's why they're drawn here in the first place. So being said that uh, we want to stop that, we should almost take that as a compliment that these people want to come here because it means that we're doing things the right way. By no means do we want to change that. We want to we want Fayette County to stay Fayette County, but we will have to try to go in and try to manage to grow to where we do not have to grow our infrastructure. Uh, the, the, you know, once again, the reason why they're coming here is because we have a great uh, medical coverage with the EMS department. We have safer homes and streets and neighborhoods because of the police departments, because of the sheriff's department. We have some of the best volunteer fire departments in the state of Texas. You know, that's what people look for whenever they go to find out where they want to raise their family and their kids. And even though it's an influx of people coming in, we shouldn't be proud that they want to come here and be a part of it. Okay, thank you. That uh, concludes the first session.
about a 10 minute break right now. If you have any questions that you want us to uh, address to the candidates, there was index cards up at the signing desk. Uh, give them to uh, Calvin over there. He's waving his hand, so he's going to walk around and pick up your questions. <laughs> that same issue out there even on County Road. And just being aware of that, uh, I'm not aware of any right now as far as tort, tort and liability. The other part of, of tort claims is a uh, dump truck going down the road and, and it's not tarp and it loses rocks or tailgates open, breaks your windshield. Those, those are little minor claims compared to bigger things that are going out. And with more and more people, more and more trucks on the road, it's just uh, being aware and having the knowledge and, and doing the best you can as a good steward uh, for the county, for our tax dollars, uh, is one of, one of my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, so through uh, the tort liability being mentioned and needing to be addressed, are you aware, aware of any case in which the county has suffered financially from a claim like this? Over the past year, being the commissioner, I'm not aware of any claim or anything like that. You know, at the Road and Bridge Department, we do our best to keep up with all of the signage and make sure everything's properly uh, installed and put up. Uh, that being said, we do, and, and Precinct 4, have 196 miles of road to take care of. So that is a lot of signs, a lot of stuff that you have to look over. You can go ahead and you can go out and you can send your crew, you can replace all the signs that need to be replaced, the ones that are damaged, and, and in one weekend's time, the high school kids have a good time, and you'll miss half of those signs that you just put up the day before. It's sad, but it's the world that we live in. Not saying that we don't go right back and we just keep replacing them, keep replacing them. Uh, as far as our equipment that we have there at our yard, uh, as soon as I took over, I made sure that all of our equipment, dump trucks, belly dumps, everything has the properly installed tarps to where no material will fly off the top. All of our employees are uh, very well trained and disciplined whenever we leave the yard. You make sure that your vehicles are cleaned off to make sure that you will not be losing any rocks and rocks that are going down the road. So you will not uh, break anybody's windshield or injure anybody into the future. It's all mainly about just the work ethic. If you set a good example for your employees, what they expect, if they see you doing it out there whenever you were working, they know that that is the right way to do it. And as soon as you start that work ethic, it's just a gradual thing. Everybody stays in line. Everybody goes ahead and takes care of their equipment. Whenever they see something needs to be replaced or fixed, they do it at the right time. Thanks. I'd like to make some interesting questions here. This one might just require a, a couple word response, or you can expand if you'd like. But the question was, uh, are you vaccinated for COVID? Yes, I am. I have the uh, two Moderna vaccinations. I have not had my booster one in, and yes, I do. Okay, Steve. Uh, I have also had both of the Moderna two round doses. Have not uh, had the booster. Okay. Next question, starting with Stephen. Uh, you've said it's important to keep residents' tax rates low. Uh, one way to do that is to resist extraordinary tax breaks for businesses located in Fayette County, for example, solar farms and, uh, and, item, and exemptions that offer no job growth. Another way is not to give out tax dollars to charities that are favored by commissioner's court but instead allow citizens, citizens to contribute to their uh, desired charities. Uh, we pledge to help citizens in this way. I didn't follow the very end of it. Uh, it, it just says we, we pledge to uh, follow, help, help the citizen in, in this way. Basically, uh, talk about uh, keeping the tax rate slow and uh, targeting what your uh, uh, donations go to. Will you pledge to keep the tax rates low? Ta tax rates, yes. I, I would strive to do the the best. Yes, we gotta we gotta balance the budget for the county. Uh, again, I think I mentioned it earlier with the uh, you know just inflation, the appraised value of land. You see it keep going up. Uh, you know, more money is going to come in even with not raising the tax rate itself because of the value of everything else goes up. Uh, as far as donations, I'm not totally following. Yes, there are some funds that are out there that go to uh, local fire departments to help them. Uh, some of that is off the mandates that I'm, I'm not totally, I would guess they're off the mandates. Uh, some of it, hotel 
down motel uh, taxes. Some of that's mainly city, but also uh, you're looking at a big uh, north end, northeast side of the county with antique fair. There's probably a lot of tax dollars unaccounted for up there. Uh, I know there's been a lot of a lot of work in recent years to strive to bring some of that money back in. Being that I'm not in, in that office right now, I am not aware of it, but I will make sure I, I do the best I can and, and learn and see where some of that is going, if elected. Thank you. Okay, so Drew, again, just to summarize, it, uh, it's been said it's important to keep the tax rates low. One way to do that is uh, to avoid tax breaks that uh, produce no long-term job growth. Uh, another way is to uh, not give uh, monies to favored charities, but uh, instead allow the citizens to uh, make the choice of their heart. We pledge to uh, help the U.S. citizens. We have a pledge to help the citizens in this way. Yes, absolutely. You know, the number one uh, goal that I have is to make sure that the tax rate stays low so everybody can have affordable life, livelihood in Fayette County, be able to enjoy their, their dream. Uh, as far as the tax breaks go, uh, the one that I was involved in was for Purdue, was for Purdue Farms here in Schubert. It is a, a business and a company that is growing fast. It's an industrial company that hires uh, tons of people in this area, gives them good, high-paying, quality jobs with benefits. And that is the type of jobs and the type of growth of the industry that you need in the area. Whenever you have a town like Schubert that was failing for a while, we had so many industries and businesses that were leaving. Whenever you have somebody that's willing to come in and make this investment in the long run, the amount of money that you get besides the little tax break that you're, you're, you're giving to that industry, uh, I believe their, their uh, payroll was going to be a million dollars a year with the amount of employees that they were going to hire and everything. So you look at that, where are those two employees going to live? They're going to live in Fayette County. They're going to pay taxes. They're going to build houses. They're going to spend their money here. Uh, as far as the other uh, things that Fayette County gives money toward, uh, the animal shelter. One of the things about the animal shelter, the reason why we help support them, if, if Fayette County did not have Gardena Animal Shelter, Fayette County would be liable to have a dog town or dog shelter, and that would cost the taxpayers way more money than what we give the animal shelter per year to keep them operating. Uh, before, you know, you have uh, deputies that are going around picking up. Okay. We'll come back to uh, Drew for the uh, last question here in the uh, mail-in questions. Um, do you believe, and can you expound upon, whether people should be able to uh, speak their minds openly and freely at school board, city council, uh, and city council meetings, even if they radically disagree with the way things are being done, as long as they remain calm, civil, and respectful? Absolutely, 100%. That's one of the greatest things about the United States that we need to live in, is the freedom of speech. Uh, it's like here today, I am able to sit here and say what I think. Stephen's able to sit there and say what he thinks. As soon as we get out here tonight, you can all come up to us and tell us exactly what you think. That's the greatest thing about the United States of America. Why on earth would you want to try to take that liberty away from people? Uh, once again, you have to show respect to the crowd that you're at, of course. you know, Whenever you're speaking in front of the public, if you're at a school board and you have kids there, what are the things or what are the uh, values that you're trying to instill when you're out there speaking so passionately about something that bothers you? You have to think about the young minds that are out there watching you and the, and the language and the way that you prepare yourself and the way that you present yourself. You know, if you're, if you're passionate about something, that's great. We're all passionate. Everybody has things that they're excited about and they want to stand behind and they want to voice their opinion. But you just have to do it in the right way. I'm not saying that we're, we're limiting your speech, but you have to show respect for other people. I'm, I'm more than happy to sit down and have a conversation with anybody in the world. I'm very open. I'm very open-minded. I can take anybody's advice and stuff like that. And that's the nice thing. We don't all have to get it on. You know, the whole world now, as soon as somebody says something, somebody gets all upset and gets all frustrated. You're not allowed to say this. You're not allowed to say that. We can not all agree, but we can still work together to make Fayette County a great place to live. Okay, for Stephen, uh, do you believe, and can you expound upon, that people should uh, be able to speak their minds openly, freely at school board, city council, etc., even if they radically disagree with the way things are being done as long as they are remain calm and civil. I got to follow through on that one. <laughs> he got took all my words. No, yes, agree 100%. Uh, it's the God-given right that we have for the country we live in. Uh, freedom of speech, yes. Uh, stay civil. Uh, respect your fellow man, fellow woman. Uh, you know, as long as you can do it that way, you don't have to call Mr. Gendert or 
or uh, Mr. Strickland or Mr. Job in here to put handcuffs on somebody? Yes, so be it. Uh, you know, we have that right. It, it's what makes our country, our state, our county what it is today. Uh, yes, we have people that want to infringe on it. Uh, the best you can do is, is, is try to teach them, try to give them uh, live by example. Uh, live, live by your own own rights, your own given right. Uh, respect the fellow man and fellow woman. Thank you. Okay, take a deep breath and uh, Steve will go to you for uh, two minutes of closing remarks. Okay. Uh, in closing, first off, I'd like to uh, think about what we value most. Uh, Freedom, equality, and justice. Uh, I believe these values are very strong in Fayette County. I know they are. I don't believe. I know they are. And I promise you that if elected Precinct 4 Commissioner, I will strive to do my best in maintaining these values. Uh, my door, like I said earlier, will always be open. Only a phone call away. Uh, I will work hard for the citizens of the county. Uh, and something I'll go back on. My dad taught me years ago. Uh, and for different things. You do not get paid to lie, so always be straightforward and tell the truth. Uh, sometimes we don't like the truth, but we can and need to learn from it. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming out to this forum, along with uh, Ms. Frank and the Republican Party of Fayette County for putting this together. Uh, March 1st is only 37 days away. Uh, we enjoy the right and liberty be able to go out and vote and make our voices heard uh, as citizens. Uh, and it's by the right to elect your political leaders, office holders. So please, everyone, tell your friends, your neighbors, uh, make your voice heard, go out there. Uh, I kind of had a point and the question never came up. Uh, go out and drive on those roads, county roads, city roads, state roads. Go to that polling location and vote. That's, that's the biggest thing you can do. Oh, and vote yes for Stephen Matula County. <laughs> Thank you. And you've got your two minutes. Uh, you know, I am not a politician. I never wanted to be a politician. I am just a blue collar worker that enjoys what he does. I believe in Fayette County. I believe in its citizens. I believe in the workers that we have here. I believe that we're going in the right direction. You know, I brought myself from the bottom up. When I first started out of school, I was shoveling uh, human waste at the sewer plant right in the back of the garbage truck. It taught me humility. It taught me how important every single job is that takes place for a municipality. You know, it takes the guy from the bottom all the way up to the top. Nobody's more important than that next person. If everybody doesn't do their job, we're never going to come together and we're never going to make Fayette County the greatest place on earth. Uh, you know, if you want a commissioner that's energetic, that's passionate about his job, I'm the right man for the job. If you want a commissioner that will be a good steward of your taxpayer dollars, I'm the right man for the job. If you want a commissioner that will make sure that he makes all the right decisions for Fayette County to go into the future, I'm the right man for the job. If you want a commissioner that makes sure that you have all the uh, county uh, uh, support through EMS, through fire, through road and bridge department, through the sheriff's department, I am the right man for the job. I know what I'm doing. I've proven myself. I've proven results for a positive future. And that's what I believe in. Uh, you know, March 1st is the Republican primary. I'm asking for your vote. I'm asking for your support so that we can keep this train rolling and we can make Fayette County one of the greatest places to live in. Uh, before I go, I have to thank my wife. <clears throat> She's my backbone and my support this whole time. So thank you.
I'll tell you these candidates and be able to make an informed decision in the March 1st primary. So, thank you.
moving here from Bell County around 1990. She uh, was the extension agent here, which we know are new back then as the Homemakers Club until she retired about uh, 12 years ago or so. And I also want to recognize my dear friend and treasurer of my campaign, Mr. Gene Krupa. I was sitting here moments ago and I got to thinking, I think perhaps Gene Krupa is the longest serving elected official here in the county. He's been a county surveyor since, uh, I think, 82. I think I'll, uh, I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, Gene and his wife, Beverly, thank you all for being here today and thank all of you for being here. I am seeking the office, uh, office of County Judge, born and raised here in Schulenburg, just outside of Schulenburg city limits where the uh, contact business stands today. Uh, my home phone, uh, home uh, house was just across the street there, about a half a mile from where sits Glenn College. In those days, when I was growing up, Bishop Forest High School stood there. I grew up there with my uh, three sisters, uh, two of the three, Barbara and Teresa, live in LaGrange. My sister Donna, the youngest in the family, lives in Holman. I have a brother who lives here, Gary, and I have an older brother, the eldest brother in the family who lives in Weimar. Um, I have been Justice of the Peace here in this part of the precinct of the county uh, for the past 27 years. This is my 28th year now. Uh, people ask me why I am seeking the office. I've been close to the county office for many, many years. And I don't want to demean anyone at this table, but I was literally inundated by calls because people weren't happy with the candidates that were seeking the office. And that's why I got into the office. I got into the office because I'm familiar with the workings of the office. Prior to coming here today, on my radio program, my good friend Mike Petrosh stopped by to visit with me. Mike has been my dear friend for 45 years. His dad served as county judge here in Fayette County. He actually died in office in 1969. Fritz Lowprice was county judge when I went to work at the radio station when I was 21 years of age. Of course, the radio station is involved with county government. Judge Lowprice was a good friend of mine. I we met weekly to have coffee. 1990, Judge Beck became county judge. He finished his tenure on the bench as district judge. When he died in 2015, I did a eulogy at his, at his uh, funeral service. And I also want to close by saying my oldest brother was roommate at Sam Houston State with Judge Ed Dineshka, who just finished 28 years as our county judge. Thank you. Okay, Craig, you have your two minute over to rewards. Thank you. And I would also like to thank the moderator and uh, the organizers for this. Uh, I think the rules set forth to not disparage other candidates is fantastic. Uh, I think we live in a very fortunate place to have uh, amazing candidates. I've been to many, many, many elections where I had to pick between the, the luster of the evils, and I believe that we're very fortunate uh, up and down the ballot uh, to have a lot of really good people in this county to vote for, and I hope that you guys will choose me as the best choice. Uh, if you don't, you can rest assured that there are other really good people on the ballot uh, and they're sitting here at this table, uh, some amazing folks that have really contributed a lot to this county. Uh, I live in Precinct 2 uh, off 237 with my wife Jamie and our three daughters. Our daughters are all named after Republican presidents. I have Reagan, Madison, and the little one Lincoln. Uh, and they're amazing ladies. I tell you what, uh, we even have two girl dogs, so I'm kind of surrounded by ladies. Uh, but they are strong and powerful and uh, do amazing things. I'm very proud of my daughter Reagan, who is a member of the Faith County Republican Women, and uh, I believe will be an incredible leader in this county. Uh, <clears throat> I come from a law enforcement family. My dad, my grandpa, my great grandpa, all of my uncles uh, were firefighters, uh, raised, some of them stayed patrolmen their entire careers, some of them raised a police chief, uh, and everywhere in between, they have a breadth of experience that is. Uh, quite amazing. Uh, I was the black sheep in the family and went to the fire department. I uh, spent two decades as a uh, Houston firefighter and a paramedic. Uh, prior to that, I was a youth minister uh, in the fire department. Uh, I was, like I said, a paramedic. I uh, raised to the rank of senior captain. Uh, I'm a master firefighter in Texas, a master marine firefighter. I have a hazmat technician certification, uh, swiftwater rescue, and I supervise as many as 400 firefighters uh, during a large event or during special circumstances. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for almost all first responders, you have to have a second job because it's very, very hard to support a family 
as a first responder. If you look around this room, almost everyone who uh, carries a gun or drags a fire hose or, or serves as a paramedic uh, does something else on the side. Uh, mine has been a strong business background. I've worked in medical research for small, medium, and large uh, companies, including the 40th largest company in the world, uh, which has given me a business background that has been outstanding. Um, I also very much enjoy taking uh, medical mission trips around the world. I've been to Central America, all throughout uh, the USA, and uh, even to Asia, uh, serving as a medical, medical missionary. Uh, currently, I'm your Chief of Emergency Management and Homeland Security for Fayette County, Texas. I was hired by an amazing man, a three-star general, uh, Judge Joe Weber, and uh, learned a tremendous amount uh, from him. Uh, during that time, we've had some really crazy experiences, as you all know. We've had a worldwide pandemic that has shut down the world. We've had to make tough decisions. Uh, we've had a freeze that froze the entire state of Texas, something you never thought would be able to happen. Uh, we've had 100-year, 200-year, 500-year floods happen on almost a monthly basis. And what were you going to do here to open your remarks? My name is Lori Berger. Uh, I am from Flatonia, Texas. I was born and raised there. Born in Wyoming, raised in Flatonia. Uh, I have three grandchildren uh, that all have amazing jobs, have amazing careers, uh, raising children, and, and I'm lucky enough to have six grandchildren. Uh, living in Flatonia, uh, being part of the community, different organizations, I uh, realized my interests and possibly becoming a member of the city council. So I ran for city council, was elected, became mayor pro tem. I went from that to running for mayor, being the first woman in Flatonia to run for mayor, and I was elected. I served uh, in that capacity for, um, I think, eight to nine years. And that's not always easy, being in a small town and everyone knowing exactly what you do or where you are, they'll find you if there's a problem. We did a lot of good things for quite many positive things to help it grow. Uh, I know it's not, you know, all glitter, but we did a brand new sewer system, the uh, septic system uh, for the town. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that needed to be done because it hadn't been done before. I believe in uh, taking a step forward and step, instead of taking a step back and having to realize that you didn't do something that could have prevented problems with, say, septic systems or anything else. Uh, I have uh, served on several uh, state boards. I was appointed first by Ann Richards and then reappointed um, by George Bush. And, uh, and then recently just uh, finished a 12-year tenure, tenure at uh, the LCRA, where I served as land and community uh, chair. And I want to bring what I've learned and the people that I've met that, that can help they can and what I've learned to Fayette County and to represent every, every person of Fayette County. I'm not a politician. If I can't do something for you, I will tell you that. If I can, I will help you. But I'm not a politician. Okay, now we'll go to our questions and there'll be one minute and 30 seconds for each question, starting with uh, Dan. How familiar are you with the responsibilities of county judges? What experience has provided you with that familiarity? Well, as I uh, said in the opening statement, I believe that uh, I've been familiar with uh, the workings of county government, county judge's office for over 50 years. I've spent 27 years as, uh, and all my 28 years, as Justice of the Peace. And you know, the Justice of the Peace office is a it's a varied office. In other words, I don't know if you saw earlier when this program started, but I had a city officer sign up here, uh, come in here earlier to sign a warrant. The JP office is, a, is not a set eight to five position. It is, uh, you get called out at all hours of the night and all hours of the day. 
and there was an individual who stole a uh, Leon's electric truck here last night inside the city limits, and there was a chase, and that individual was arrested. When law enforcement doesn't see an actual crime taking place, they must secure a warrant. That warrant comes from a justice of the peace. So uh, what qualifies me to seek this office, the familiarity of it, uh, the knowledge of the county, the knowledge of the people, uh, I believe the position of county judge should be a reflection of the people, and I believe in this race for county judge, I am the person that most reflects the people of Fayette County. Okay, for Craig, how familiar are you with the responsibilities of the county judge and what experience has provided you, you with this familiarity? Uh, I'm extremely familiar with the, uh, what the county judge does. He's my direct report. Uh, my office is about 400 feet from his, uh, and I share uh, an office wall with the commissioner's courtroom. Uh, there are three main duties of, of the county judge. Uh, I found out throughout this campaign, a lot of people don't know that. They don't know the difference between a county judge and a district judge and what exactly they do. Uh, the county judge acts as the de facto kind of mayor of the county. Uh, they preside over commissioner's court, which is kind of the um, city council of the county, if you will, and, uh, and make the budget. They, they determine salaries. They uh, determine the direction we're going with infrastructure. They determine what grants we're going to go out for. It's a very important uh, role. The second thing that the county judge does is presides over the judicial issues. Uh, they, they do the uh, small courts uh, dealing with uh, misdemeanor crimes, with juvenile crimes, and something that I'm uh, very passionate about, which is dealing with probates. When someone dies and you're going through your toughest time, you want someone in front of you that's got a compassionate ear, uh, that's got a soft heart, and kind of guide you through those difficult times. So probates are very important. And then third, the judge is the director of emergency management. Everything I do as the emergency management chief goes through the county judge. Uh, those roles are set forth uh, by statute in the state. Uh, there's a plethora of laws that go with that, and that's something I could not be more familiar with and I'm very passionate about. Uh, during the normal times, you know, emergency management isn't always uh, visible, but during our worst times, we are. Okay, for Lori, how familiar are you with the responsibilities of county judge, and what experience has provided you with this familiarity? Well, I think for starters, uh, doing the budget for the city of Flatland, you gave me a good idea of how that works working within uh, the municipality in Flatland. Uh, working with uh, meeting with employees and uh, our heads of the departments to make sure that we're covered. And going forward, I see kind of the same thing here, but there's a lot more communities to cover. And I, I would hope to be able to meet with every community to make sure that they're represented in the budget, uh, the things they need, and that probably would be the first thing I do is if, if elected. Okay, for William, same question. How familiar are you with the responsibilities of the county judge and what experience has provided you with that familiar, familiarity? Well, the only constitutional requirement for the office is that they be well informed in the laws of the state. Uh, I've been a student of the law for many years, especially the state and the U.S. Constitution, and especially the Bill of Rights. And I take that very seriously. And the position of county judge, it's often, it's often overlooked how important the fact that they are actually a judge is. Most people think that it's the chief executive of the county judge is the chief executive of the county. Presides over commissioners' court, probate court, county court, juvenile court. It's actually the commissioners that basically run the county, and the chief executive simply executes the will of the commissioners' court. I'm certainly, well, uh, very opinionated and passionate about many things, so I will be quick to offer my wise counsel when it's necessary. But I would largely defer to county commissioners and their wise and their judgment. Okay, second question, starting with Craig. Explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and or licenses will make you the best candidate to serve as county judge. Well, as I heard earlier, I have a very wide variety of licenses and, and a lot of uh, different experiences uh, that, that bring me to this position. Uh, obviously, the most glaring is uh, as a nurse management chief. Uh, I am working with the judge day in and day out doing that uh, right now. It's something that, that is a, a very routine uh, thing for me, but 
it's not a routine when it comes to you dealing with the worst emergency of your life. Um, I, as a paramedic, I will see the, the Bay County EMS, which is under the county judge's office, and then giving notes out with that, along with the commissioner's uh, court as well. Uh, you know, I've got a very wide uh, variety of, of experiences. Uh, as a youth minister, I think that will give me a lot of experience uh, dealing with juvenile court. You know, the juveniles come in to court, they're not necessarily needing a, a one-year term in jail. What they're really needing is some course correction, and uh, they're needing some guidance, they're needing some leadership, they're needing someone to kind of show them the way. Uh, I think, you know, a kid who's maybe doing some bad things, uh, going out on the road and picking up trash all day on the side of the road can, can kind of change their opinion about things. Uh, there's some other kids that may need a little uh, stronger uh, hand, but really a lot of times they just need uh, some guidance one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's one thing I've very much enjoyed seeing Judge Weber do. A kid will come into the uh, to his office and kind of counsel him that you know you you can do better, you can make uh, better decisions and go forward. And I've seen some amazing turnaround through that. And that wasn't done by giving them some harsh sentence. That was done by giving them some love and some truth. Okay, for so Lori, explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and or licenses will make you the best candidate to serve the county judge. Well, I've uh, had plenty of experience working with people uh, through the mayor uh, title that I carried for quite some time. And uh, just being a resident of a small town of Fayette County, I uh, volunteered for so many organizations. I uh, worked with our Catholic Church uh, for our CCD classes. I uh, just believe in the future, the future of Fayette County and in the state of Texas is in our youth. And I think that if we don't step up now and show them that good role models what that looks like, that they will go on about their way and never realize what they could have become when they get older. Um, I think that every part of being a judge is an important step. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You're representing an amazing amount of people, and you want to do what's best for everyone, and not everyone is going to be happy always. But I believe that Working together and leaning on each other, we can bring out an outcome for the county that can make be suitable for everyone. Okay, same so question for William. Explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and or licenses will make you the best candidate to serve as county judge. Probably, uh, there's probably two things I'd like that I think are that matter the most in this case. The first and foremost is that you know, I'm a land surveyor, and um, three of the faces on the Mount Rushmore are land surveyors, and Thomas Jefferson and Washington were both county surveyors, and they're not on that mountain because they were surveyors, but there's, it's no coincidence that there are three surveyors on that mountain. It's because of their understanding of land and land law and what land is and how important it is to the people. Land is foundational to the government. Landowners founded this country. And I've dealt with every kind of, I've, I've been all over the place. I've surveyed just about everything imaginable from the King Ranch to rivers to beaches. I've surveyed an aircraft carrier. Just about everything we do is attached to the land in some way and our income is derived from land, our food comes from the land, and in every way we deal with land, and I understand land law, easements, dedications, um, regulations. I've read the zoning and subdivision regulations in probably 30 counties. I'm qualified to rewrite zoning and subdivision regulations. Um, the other thing is, again, I have to go back to my study of the law. I, it, not all of these laws that I read are relevant to county government, but if I had the time to list all of the laws and, and subjects that I have studied, studied, you would see very clearly that I have. Okay, for the answer to the question, explain how your personal background, educational degrees, experience, and or licenses will make you the best candidate to serve as a county judge. Well, you know, I think we're all... Uh, we all exist after our life experiences. What we go through in life, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the county judge's office has been an office that I've been close to for 50 years. I didn't 
finish my uh, opening remarks because I ran out of time, but I uh, see my good friend Judge Eddie Neshka here who served as county judge for 28 years, 28 years, and while he was operating as county judge, I was operating as a justice of the peace for precinct four. So the experiences of life, I feel, is what qualifies me to hold this office. I certainly know the people of the county. I certainly know the difference between Plum and Praha. The people know me, and I believe I'm the right person to do the job. Okay, great. Next question, sir. Lori, what are your current sources of income, and if elected, will you continue them? If so, how will it affect your ability to perform your duties as county judge? Well, I own a restaurant in Flatonia, Texas, that I have uh, hired an amazing staff to run. I um, have no doubt that they'll be able to carry on without me, probably do better. And then uh, as far as any assets that I might uh, might have, if there is a question, and I've, I've filled out the Ethics Commission every year for the last 12 years. And there's never been a problem with any of the stocks or anything else that I hold. So. Okay, for uh, what are your current sources of income, and if elected, will you continue them? If so, how will it affect your ability to perform your duties as county judge? Uh, my primary source of income is, of course, the revenue from the business that I've operated for 20 years. Sadly, I will be unable to continue that business, and it'll frankly break my heart to have to give it up for county judge. It's something I'll have to do, and I'm willing to do. My wife operates Plum Fabulous Foods, and she generates revenue for herself, and I'm sure that will continue. Dan, same question. What are your current sources of income, and if elected, will you continue them? If so, how will it affect your ability to perform your duties as county judge? Well, uh, my current income is through uh, the county, Justice of the Peace. I own part of the radio station uh, in the range. Uh, I've been associated with the radio stations I mentioned earlier for 45 years. Uh, it's not going to affect my position as county judge. I will continue doing what I'm doing right now, which is the morning news. I go on at, at 7 and I'm, I'm out the door by 8. So unless Deputy Terry Ginter or Constable Strickland gives me a ticket for exceeding the speed limit down the bluff, I'll be at the courthouse at roughly 815, 820 to conduct uh, the business of the county. Uh, I do have property dealings, which I have been asked about in this campaign, and I'll freely answer those of uh, property questions. I have, over the last 20 years or so, developed property. I'm proud of what I've done. Uh, there are restrictions in how property can be those restrictions, and uh, I have made property more available for these people who can't afford a 100 acres or 200 acre tract of land. So I've developed those tracts into 15, 20 acre tracts, and more people can afford to come over here to Fayette County and enjoy what we all want to enjoy. Okay, for Craig, what are your current sources of income, and if elected, will you continue them? budget is a very complex thing and 
looking through it, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of departments, a lot of categories. Um, I have experience with software development. I've actually developed accounting software, so not only can I understand complex budgets, but I can actually develop software to manage those budget, budgets. Also with business, it's, it's usually about the people that are involved, and so uh, managing disputes, um, calming nerves, moderating debates, I'm generally a peacemaker. So I, I love hearing from people, and I appreciate any wise counsel that I can get. And so I think I've got good experience working with people, and that's usually one of the most important. Okay, Dan, in order of reports, what are the three most challenging responsibilities the county judge position? Well, we've been fortunate here in the county. Uh, prior to the 28 years that Judge Yudeshka put in, uh, Judge Beck was county judge for, uh, uh, I guess, 8 to 12 years. Judge Lowprice, Judge Petrosh, and uh, they've, they've been good stewards of, of, the, of the taxes here in the county. We've had conservative, conservative leadership. And that's what we are here in Fayette County. We're fiscal conservatives. So primarily, we want to make sure that the tax dollars are spent wisely. We want to make sure that our EMS, that our Sheriff's Department, we've also been very fortunate to have strong law enforcement. Prior to Sheriff Perenic, we had Sheriff Vandal, did a fantastic job. Uh, Sheriff Copeland, Sheriff Floyd, all fiscal conservatives providing professional law enforcement, but always cognizant of keeping the expenses down as low as possible. So I would say the best way that a county judge can look out for the tax dollars is to keep spending at low and provide those services such as the fire departments, the highway uh, patrol officers, the deputies, the constables and such, and of course the EMS. Okay, for credit, in order to report sort of the three most challenging responsibilities of the county judge position. Uh, the three most challenging responsibilities are, just happen to be the three things that I've put in my pledge to Fayette County. That's ensuring safety, building community, and providing prosperity. Uh, we ensure safety by making sure we have first responders that are able to, to live and work in Fayette County. Uh, our retention and, and recruiting of first responders was one of the major things that was noted by every single department in this county. Uh, we don't pay our police officers enough, and we're losing them. We lost one this week to another place. It costs us more not to pay them correctly, because then we have to bring in and train somebody else. It's a losing proposition. We need to get our, our police officers, our paramedics paid well. Uh, we need to look at getting our volunteer firefighters a, a, a stipend in the, in the way of a retirement, which some of our departments have already done, and that will ensure our safety. Uh, we're going to build community by bringing all of our churches and nonprofits together and have a consortium that can do things ahead of time instead of retroactively after a disaster. Uh, we're going to give all those churches and community organizations that want to participate uh, a role in providing what is needed uh, after a, a disaster and also during the good times and giving them tools. And then we're going to provide prosperity by keeping our tax rate low. I was at the forefront of this tax discussion. It's all my signs. Bring, keeping taxes low brings in more revenue in the end run because it brings in good businesses, businesses that give people honorable jobs that they can be proud of and build our community strong. We don't necessarily have to bring in a ton of people to build our community. We just have to bring in places that are able to give a great wage and keep our community safe. Okay, for order, in order of reports, what are the three most challenging responsibilities of the county judge position? Well, I think the verses are the safety of our uh, citizens. Uh, by helping the EMS and helping the um, fire department as well as the police department. Uh, those are the three major things that we need to protect our citizens and that's why we're here. None of us would be here if we weren't interested in protecting our citizens. Uh, our uh, as we look to the future, things change daily, as well as equipment, and uh, we've had, we've maintained equipment that's probably been outdated 10 years ago, and hopefully be able to start replacing some of that equipment gradually, as well as raises fire departments, for our EMS, and, and that means throughout the county, not just in, in the branch. Okay, next question, start with Dan. 
What do you see as the role of county judge regarding the enforcement of government mandates? Would you repeat that, please? What do you see as the role of county judge regarding the enforcement of government mandates? Well, I mean, if they're government mandates, uh, they should be enforced. Is that your question? I'll leave it uh, just the way it is. What is my, what is the county judge function as far as government mandates? Well, I guess if there's a government mandate and it's the government is demanding that it's uh, mandated, the county should follow through with that. Uh, of course, you know, the thing about the county judge is the county attorney's office is right down below the, uh, the next floor and the county judge can always go to the county attorney to uh, discuss any issue for that matter. But something like that, I would certainly throw past the commissioners and the, and, uh, the county attorney. And uh, if there's a government mandate that must be mandated, then it would be implemented. Okay, for Craig, again, what do you see as the role of the county judge regarding the enforcement of government mandates? You know, some of the mandates come down from the governor's office, and one of the major roles from, from the county judge is talking to the governor, is talking to uh, the legislators that have the ability to make that decision. I've got a very good relationship with many, many people that work in the capital in Austin, and I'm against mandates in almost every way. I think the, the worst thing you can do, especially the Bay County folk who, who like to do things their own way, is tell them they have to do something. A much, much better way is to educate them on why it's a good decision to do this or do that. You can talk about that, say, with a burn ban. You know, if things get really, really bad, we have to enforce a burn ban, but as we get closer to that, we can talk to people and say, hey, it's not really a great idea. I was firmly against the mask mandates. I didn't think it was a good idea to tell people they have to wear a mask. I think it was a much better idea to say, hey, there's something really nasty out there that we don't understand completely. Would you please consider doing this for a while while we figure it out? That makes a whole lot more sense to me than telling somebody, hey, you absolutely have to do something. I don't like being told what to do. A lot of other people don't like being told what to do. But if you explain to me why something's important and you explain to me in, in good measure, uh, then people are much more likely to do that. Okay, for Rory, what do you see as the rule of the county judge regarding the enforcement of government mandates? Well, first of all, I don't uh, believe in mandates. I think that every citizen in Fayette County and throughout uh, Texas, throughout the United States, has their own ability to make their own decisions. But as far as mandates with the county, with uh, citizens, they would have to prove to me that it was vital for the health and well-being of our entire county to be able to make me feel assured that I was doing the right thing. It's not something that you can just tell someone you have to do. And make and because you're making decisions for every citizen in the county, not just yourself. Lawyer, to you, what do you sees the role of the county judge regarding the enforcement of government mandates. Well, in order to enforce any mandate, it must be lawful. Any law or order or mandate that is repugnant to the Constitution is null and void from the beginning as if it never existed. Um, I, too, would seek wise counsel from Mrs. Schupach quite often, but there are certain things that I don't need help with. In anything we mention in the Bill of Rights, or anything involving the rights of the citizens, um, are, are ex ex expressly excluded from the general powers of government by the Bill of Rights. And so certain things I don't need help with. Quite frankly, there's uh, not a lot of things that the county judge can do on their own, and they're, uh, they're going to need community support. It's the citizens who are actually in the government. The citizens actually run the county. And so if something difficult comes down, it's going to be up to the county judge to seek wise counsel from not just government departments, but from the citizens and other areas of the government. And together they make the decision what should be done. But in no case would I ever infringe on the natural rights of citizens to make their own determinations. Quite frankly, I think the citizens are capable of making wise decisions by themselves, and they don't need to be told what to do by the government. Okay, next question, we'll start with uh, Craig. Considering any personal, financial, or property investments, how will you ensure there is never a real or perceived conflict of interest if you are elected county judge? It's pretty easy for Brooke Farman. I don't have a whole lot of those. 
Uh, I've got a farm that I was very fortunate to buy uh, when my 13-year-old daughter was in the womb. Uh, I bought it at a good time because I couldn't uh, afford it now. There's no way that the property price has gone up so much. Uh, but that doesn't really matter to me and my family because we never plan on selling it. Uh, my son is buried in Plum. I plan on being buried in Plum as well, right next to him. And I don't ever plan on dividing or selling my, my family farm. So I have no conflicts of interest. Very glad to not have any conflicts of interest. And uh, that's that's an easy, quick question. I'll yield the rest of my time. Okay, for more consider any personal, financial, or property investments, how will you ensure there is never a real or perceived conflict of interest if you are elected county judge? First of all, I would definitely research before I bought any property or any type of investment. Uh, there's no way I would let myself become a part of something that could hurt myself or uh, the county. I'd be a, a bad reflection. Uh, I just don't think it's necessary and I, it wouldn't, wouldn't happen to me. Okay, for what you would consider any personal, financial, or property investments, how would you ensure there is never a real or perceived conflict of interest if you were elected county church? And it's a pretty simple question. I have no conflicts. And there is nothing as, uh, that will prevent me from dedicating my time and service to the county and, and to doing what's best for the city. Okay, moving right along. Dan, considering any personal or financial investments, how will you ensure there is never a real or perceived conflict of interest to you if you are elected county judge? Well, uh, I would say that you don't remain in office for 28 years uh, unless you're a person of integrity. And uh, you don't remain in the public eye for 45 years unless you're uh, someone of integrity. People know me. I'm not going to do anything unethical. Uh, I'm sure it's not going to start now. So uh, I would not do anything that would be unethical. That went fairly quickly. I'll we'll start with the Lori this time. Uh, if in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by government act during the last two years, identify the lawful justification for them. Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat one more time? If in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by Governor Abbott during the last two years, identify the lawful justifications for them. I don't believe that there are any lawful justifications for a governor to tell me that I have to wear a mask or that you have to do things. I, I don't believe in that. Period. Period. I, I won't waver from that. I think everyone has a right to choose what they do. Uh, I understand uh, with the schools, Governor Abbott said that <coughs> teachers did not have, should not wear a mask, or students should not. In that case, I think that is up to every child's parent to make that decision, not not for a governor, not for me or anyone else. Their parents should make that decision. Okay. William, if in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by government Abbott during the last two years, identify the lawful justification for that. There is not. Um, I've read the Bill of Rights many times in the past couple of years, and the rights to conduct business and to travel about freely, and the decisions you make about your body, and the rights of assembly are specifically mentioned in the Bill of Rights. And again, anything mentioned in the Bill of Rights is expressly excluded from the general powers of the government. Our right to conduct business doesn't come from government, it comes from God. They are natural rights. All of those natural rights are protected by the Bill of Rights and they excluded from the general powers of the government. He purport, the governor purported, uh, alleged to, that he could suspend laws and he alleged that he did subscribe from the Texas Disaster Act. And the Texas, Texas Disaster Act does not give the governor to suspend any law. There's only few and specific laws, and most of them are related to regulations and agency rules, and nothing about natural rights. So even Justice the Divine of the Texas Supreme Court called the entire Disasters Act of questionable constitutionality simply because the governor claimed the authority to suspend the laws under it. 
and again, the Constitution grants the state legislature the authority to suspend laws alone. Hey, again, same question. If in agreement with the restrictions placed on us by government and during the last two years, identify the lawful justification for them. Well, I would say that uh, we all need to give uh, the governors and the uh, U.S. government uh, the benefit of that they're acting in the best interest of the citizenry. Uh, in other words, if Governor Abbott say, says that it is best that we do this, I would think that the county government should have the ability to make up their mind for themselves if that suits the best for that particular county. Uh, I can't envision a scenario where a governor would do something that he thought was unlawful or would be harmful. I like to think that the people in Washington, as crazy as they are, the people in Austin, as crazy as they are, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt that they think they are doing things that's in the public best interest. And you know, we have to remember this pandemic is something that we've never seen anything the likes of. Still, we're still not out of the woods. So, I like to think that these people that are making these decisions as the governor, they're, they're doing this in the public's best interest, and they have no motive otherwise. Okay, correct me. If in agreement with restrictions placed on us by government Abbott during the past two years, identify the lawful justifications for them. You know, I was put right in the, the forefront of a lot of that stuff. He'd come out with these executive orders, and suddenly we'd have to enforce them, and we wouldn't get it ahead of time at all. Uh, as Chief of Emergency Management, Homeland Security, that's a pretty broad job. And one of the things I never anticipated was having to suddenly be a, a wedding coordinator and a party planner. Uh, one of those ridiculous uh, executive orders said that my office had to approve any gathering uh, over 100. Uh, we approved every single one of them uh, because that was the right thing to do. Now we gave some suggestions for, for some, so spread out, help provide some sanitizer. But as I said earlier, I really kind of feel like this is a follow-up question. Telling someone the right way to do things, educating them, giving them all the, the, the information you can is a much better way than telling someone they have to do something. It's just not the right way. I was in favor of many of them at the time. Uh, we did everything we could to kind of make those blows uh, go a little bit softer, and uh, you know, it was a challenge. Uh, the one thing I will say that I was in favor of uh, was his use of uh, the Stafford Act and several other uh, organizations, several other laws to allow us to give things to private entities uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we took truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of PPE to the nursing homes, to assisted living centers, to the doctor's offices, to the hospitals in our county. Normally the government can't give something to a, a private entity, but that stuff was just not available, and I believe it saved a lot of lives. So uh, under that, uh, in the specific statute, the Stafford Act, there's a few others uh, that allow the expansion of powers to do that. It, it costs some money to the taxpayers, but I think it saved some lives and was worth it. Okay, on to the next question, starting with Wade. What changes or improvements would you focus on to positively guide the future of Bay County? Um, I would probably um, start with subdivision regulations and ordinances. Being a land surveyor, that's often one of the first things on my mind. I've noticed from attending, attending the commissioner's court meetings that um, every subdivision pretty much is granted a variance. And if there's a variance for every item on the agenda, then it's a, it's an indication that the, the ordinance is not proper and needs some work. Mm -hmm. um, I think the subdivision regulations that need to make, be made more simple, they need to be updated. Um, there needs to be an administrative level subdivision where simple subdivisions can be approved administratively without having to wait on the commissioners. Uh, many jurisdictions have such regulations. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I, that's what's on my mind right now, so. Okay. For Dan, what changes or improvements did you focus on <coughs> to positively guide the future of Fayette County? Well, I don't know that uh, there's changes to be made. I mean, everything can be improved on, but, uh, you know, I'm a big believer if things aren't broke, you don't fix them. As I mentioned earlier, we've had good sound leadership here uh, for the last 50 years in Fayette County. I would probably uh, pursue uh, streaming the uh, commissioner court meetings uh, that are held monthly. I think the more people know what's going on in county government, the better for everyone. So 
that's probably what I would strive to do. The first thing is to have the commissioner's court screen live so uh, the uh, general public can, can be on top of what is happening. But, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not running for this office to make any drastic change. I think people are pretty happy in the county. Those that aren't happy, they want to vote for something else or they want to fix this or that. But uh, overall, I think the county is running a pretty sound manner. Okay, Craig, what changes or improvements would you focus on to positively guide the future of Fayette County? Uh, so over the last year, I've been working very closely with the uh, rural nonprofit group and our churches to form a coalition to let them do things that they can do better than the government. The government takes a lot of roles uh, when it comes to uh, preparing for things, for long-term recovery, for all these other things. And I think really we have people who are more talented in this county who can do a better and more efficient job. Uh, long-term recovery is a major example of that. If you go up and down Country Club Drive, you'll see a whole bunch of churches, I'm sorry, a uh, whole bunch of houses uh, that were flooded years ago during Harvey. They're still standing there, it's still rotting away because the government took over that project. Uh, if I was in charge today, we had the exact same thing. The first thing I would do would be to bring together what's called our VOADs and our COADs. That's our volunteer organizations assisting in disaster and our community organizations assisting in disaster. And I guarantee you it wouldn't look like that today. I don't know exactly what it would look like, but it wouldn't be a whole bunch of houses that people were told uh, they can't go in and they can't do this and they can't do that, lasting years and years and years. Now, the people who originally uh, came up with that didn't expect it to go that way. They expected the federal government and the state government were going to do what they said and come in and fix things. Uh, but we're not the only ones that are in that boat. There's, there's counties all over who aren't able to, to move forward with what they need to be done uh, because of, of that problem. So my, my answer is I would empower people who can do better than the government to take over the roles the government are doing right now because they have the passion to do it and we don't need to be getting in the way of their ministry. We don't need to be getting in the way of their missions. Okay, Lori, right. what changes or improvements would you focus on to positively guide the future of Fayette County? Well, the first thing I do is bring Fayette County together from one end to the next. Uh, citizens that are working with the fire department, citizens that are volunteering at libraries, citizens who are uh, working at banks, have different jobs, bring, bring them together, bring leaders together of those communities. Find out what's, what's needed in their, in their town and find out what would help them. Say they need new fire department equipment. Uh, that's something we work we'll work on together. Uh, the keeping up, keeping the EMS going, keeping all the vital uh, necessities uh, going in perfect shape. It's going to take. Some time. Okay. Um, next question, starting with Dan. In your opinion, what level of danger does the massive influx of illegal aliens into Texas pose to Fayette County, i.e. personal health and safety, county and school finances, tourism, and our historic culture? Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, in your opinion, what level of danger does the massive influx of illegal aliens into Texas pose to Fayette County, i.e. personal health and safety, county and school finances, tourism, and historic culture? Well, you know, we all know that we have a problem at the border. I see it every time I go to jail to magistrate prison. Most of the time, there are the illegal aliens. It's a problem. Uh, we have to, as a society, we have to work toward making things as better than they are. We've got a problem. I don't know what can be done about it. Hell, if we knew what was done about it, the state would have done something about it by now. Uh, so we've got a problem with illegal aliens. Uh, we've got our law enforcement guys back there. They know it better than I. Uh, it's a problem, but I don't see it as something that the county can tackle uh, unless somebody's got a good idea. Great for you. In your opinion, what level of danger does the massive influx of illegal aliens to Texas pose to Fayette County? By personal health and safety, county and school finances, tourism, and historic culture? Uh, I think it's a significant danger. That's something that I worry about a lot. Uh, as you know, I-10 runs all the way through our county, and I-10 is the, the human trafficking corridor uh, that, that is 
the worst in the nation. There are more people trafficked, both illegal aliens and people who are being sexually abused uh, down I-10 than anywhere else in the, in the country, and it's providing a huge risk to us. When our police officers pull up behind them, they uh, immediately go into a chase many times. We've had them run, run into our, our neighbors. They've had them run into strangers. They've caused massive wrecks. There have been deaths all associated with that. And, and I disagree that we can't do something about it. I think we can. I think having uh, increased license plate readers and intelligence and, and all these different things can help us crack down on this human trafficking in a major, major way. Uh, I am a threat liaison officer with the Austin Regional Intelligence Center. I get a daily briefing of things that are going on through my online security role, and we see these day in and day out and day in and day out, and there are technologies we can we can do to, to fix that. You know, it's an incremental fix. We're not going to fix the whole border crisis, but incremental fixes for this and everything else is how we get better. Uh, every day we get better, we find a little way to make this and that better, uh, and we protect our citizens from these really terrible people that are trafficking folks all around uh, the country, and many of the times through Fayette County. Okay, well, Ray, in your opinion, what level of dangers does the massive influx of illegal aliens into Texas coast to Fayette County, i.e. personal health and safety county, and school finances, tourism, and historic culture? Well, first of all, they uh, impose threat, not per se threats, but they impose I insecurity for Texas for our tech for Texans. Uh, they actually I had uh, twelve illegal aliens show up at my restaurant one night about ten thirty. They had no shoes. They had uh, very little clothing. Uh, they they were had been in a, an accident where an eighteen wheeler rolled over. And they were in the back of that ATU. So we helped them. We called the fire department. We, uh, I'm sorry, we called the police department and had them uh, come take them to where they needed to be. Uh, it's it's horrible. It's a uh, something that has to be done, but it has to be done by uh, lead, the leaders of the entire state. Well, you're saying the question again, in your opinion, what level of danger does a massive influx of illegal aliens to Texas <coughs> pose to Fayette County for personal health, safety, county and school finances, tourism, and historic culture? Uh, well, quite frankly, the vast majority of the ones coming up here are not really dangerous. There are definitely criminal elements and there is problems with being tracked to new drugs, and there are lots of nefarious folks sneaking in with them. But working down on the border quite a bit. It's pretty heartbreaking to see them walking through the woods, uh, you know, dying of thirst literally and giving themselves up and have a lot of compassion for those folks. They definitely overburden our system. Um, I don't know that they don't pay taxes like the rest of us and they, um, if, if the growth of that population continues to grow at the rate that it is, it has a chance to crash, you know, overburden and crash the system. Um, it's really not a county matter. You know, they, they take jobs, they dilute wages. Those are definitely problems. As a county judge, there's not much we can do about it but advocate with the governor's office to close the border. There is definitely things that the governor could be doing right now and should have been doing for years. Absolutely 100% lock down and close that border. And then we can deal with the, the, the other problems that we have that are in relation to immigration and that legal immigration. Okay, this is the last question in this section here, starting with Craig. In the past decade, there has been a large influx of people moving from the urban areas in Texas, as well as from out of state into Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth? What will promote, that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town values? You know, I love raising my family in Mayberry. It's fantastic. I wish I could keep it the way it is forever and ever. Uh, I love my toddler. I wish I could keep her for forever, but that's not the way it's going to be. Uh, we have to have a master plan uh, going forward. And so I've studied other places that have done it well, and I've studied other places that have failed. Uh, one, one place I think has a lot of similarity to us is Montgomery County, Texas. Uh, Montgomery County is slightly farther away from the Woodlands than we are from Bastrop, and they're slightly farther away from Houston than we are from Austin. 
And in a very, very short period of time, they saw an influx of citizens that completely overran their infrastructure. Uh, their sewers didn't work, they didn't have enough water, they didn't have roads, traffic was miserable. We have to plan as if things are going to, to happen, because they are. We can't stop it. Uh, just like I'd love to live, 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 have a little Lincoln be four years old forever, she's not going to be. Uh, but we can control that growth and, uh, and do things. There's other places that have done it well. We can look right here in Fayette County at a little microcosm uh, of Round Top. Round Top has done things to say that, hey, listen, we've got a very small community that has a very small sewer system, that has a very small water system, and they've said we're not going to allow people to kind of come in and subdivide and come in and add more homes until we can handle that. Uh, our county, as you don't know, has about 97% capacity on our sewer systems right now. Uh, it, it, we are way behind the times for a lot of the sewer systems throughout the county. Uh, thankfully, the only thing that really saves us is we have a whole lot of folks who have septic systems and have wells. Uh, we're going forward that may or may not be the case as TCEQ changes some of their rules. If we're already in the past decade, there's been a large influx of people moving from urban areas in Texas as well as from out of state in the Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth and that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town value? I think we have to start now. I think we should have started already. I think the uh, influx has started probably uh, when COVID hit. We saw more and more people coming out from the cities wanting to have their kids, their children, to have areas, places to run, play where you weren't right on top of your neighbor. Uh, one thing that uh, I, I'm concerned about is the effect of this on the schools and the EMS, the parks, our fire department, uh, all of our human services, uh, that what if that will do? And if we don't start planning now, I think we're going to be behind the curve, and that's not some place you want to be. Okay, well, even in the past decade, there's been a large influx of people moving from the urban areas in Texas as well as from out of state in Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town values? Uh, as I've been talking to folks around the county, I've been absolutely shocked at the anti-growth attitude. Um, and I'm uh, not just among some citizens, but among many governments around. And I certainly understand that desire to keep the town very small and friendly, but Quite frankly, you can't really stop it. And if you continue to try and prevent it from coming and keep your eyes, take an eyes closed attitude, you're going to get the kind of development and growth that you don't want. So the wiser choice would be to properly plan for it, to manage it, to be prepared for it when it comes. And that's going to quite frankly require a lot of conversation with a lot of folks. Um, I don't mind admitting that I don't know everything. So. Um, it, there's a lot of folks that have wise council out there, and it's going to have to. It's going to take some changing of attitude. I, I'd like to see enough growth in this county that my children have an opportunity to stay here. I don't want them to have to move away when when they move out because there's not job opportunities here, and not enough high paying jobs, and not enough opportunity. And so I, I think something needs to change, and I'm, I assure you, we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. Okay, Dan, same for you. In the past decade, there's been a large influx of people moving from urban areas in Texas as well as from out of state into Fayette County. What are your ideas for managing this growth that will promote economic opportunities while preserving our historic appeal and small town values? Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with your question about the past decade. This has been going on for 40 or 50 years here because of our geographical location. People want to get out of Houston, they want to get out of Austin. They want to get out of San Antonio, they're going to continue, continue to come here because they like Fayette County. The positive to that increases our tax base. We just have to have controlled growth. So in many ways, uh, that's the biggest job of the next county judge will be to have uh, restrictions when they're needed. We want positive growth. We don't want our uh, the people who are moving into the county to lower our, our uh, tax property values. So uh, it's an important part of this position that one of us up here is going to undertake. I understand there's a candidate in November, so not necessarily one of us, but I would say that that's one of the most important jobs of the person who takes over as county judge to 
make sure we grow. We need to grow. That grows our tax base, but we need to have growth in a controlled manner. And I think over the years we've had a good, have done a good job in the county of doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have a short break coming up until we have mm -hmm. uh, questions from the community. Yeah, we'll take about uh, just a few minutes to break and collect any questions that you may have. We'll give it to the moderator. Subdivisions being divided 
and an increase in the uh, number of residents to drill the wells. Um, how does the county prevent uh, overuse and depletion of our underground water as has been discussed at Commissioner's Court? Yeah, my office and my staff spent about eight months interviewing uh, people around the county about their needs. We interviewed 54 entities in total, uh, and some of those were the Ground Water Conservation District and also all the water boards in this county, and one that oversees not only this county but Lee County. Uh, it's something I am pretty well educated on. Uh, we have to do an actuarial analysis for water like we do for money, and if there, are, if there is more water coming out of the ground uh, than being replenished, we have to make some changes for that. Uh, the biggest change I think we can do is instantly say, right now, we're not gonna ship all our water to San Antonio. There's a big group right now that wants us to put a huge pipeline uh, from Bay County all the way to San Antonio and ship a whole bunch of water over there. Uh, you know, they'll tell you things about being a good neighbor and all these different things, and, and I wanna be a good neighbor. Uh, but San Antonio grew at a pace they couldn't keep up with. They did not have the master plan that, that we need uh, in this county, and I don't think we should be shipping millions or billions of gallons of water uh, anywhere else, uh, period, point blank, in the story. Okay. Lori, with the uh, subdivisions and large acreage properties being developed and the uh, number of uh, wells that are being drilled, how does the county prevent overuse and depletion of our underground water system and as has been discussed in the uh, first of all, I think it needs to be monitored by the county uh, very well. And the next step in, is uh, turning it over to people like Mr. Krupa, uh, companies like that to monitor all of the, the site, the uh, wells, the underground water aquifers that we have as well. The, um, it just, you don't want to give away water. You don't want to sell water. Water is the liquid gold. And from working with LCRA, that is what I have learned. Water is liquid gold for the future. And we can't sustain life without water. And we never give a drop, sell a drop out of this county. The uh, last two questions are uh, tax related. I tried to boil down a couple here. Uh, one of them talked about. Uh, the county voted previously on the creation of a hospital tax district, and then there was also a large tax increase in 2019. Your thoughts on those two items, starting with them? Well, you know, I think the majority of the people spoke in the election. Uh, in other words, it was 81% against the tax for the hospital district, and 19% voting for. Uh, the tax district, whether that was the right decision or not, well, the majority had to say. So uh, I do like the fact they put it to the voters and the voters of the people of the county decided, but obviously the uh, tax district with the uh, hospital did not fare well. Again, I repeat those numbers. Uh, it was defeated 81 to 19 percent. So the voters said no. The other for Craig, it's the same questions and uh, kind of two part there. The creation of the hospital district uh, voted uh, vote uh, a few years ago, and also the increase in the large increase in county taxes in 2019. Your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are on this are going to mimic my thoughts on a whole lot of other things. Generally, the government cannot do something better than private industry. And uh, private industry uh, can run hospitals better than the government can. A hospital district uh, has not led to good things in other places, and we should not follow that. Uh, that pattern. However, in Fayette County, you are six times more likely to die of a vascular event, such as a stroke or heart attack, and you're three times more likely to die of a neoplasm, which is a cancer, than you are in places that have primary health care that can treat those things at a very high level. Uh, I've talked a lot about this campaign through incremental approaches to different things. Uh, one of the things we need to be doing more in this county is medical research. Uh, if you know anything about the hospital St. Jude, uh, what you know is that no one that goes to St. Jude has to pay for anything. That's because every single person at St. Jude is enrolled in, in some sort of research. And that research may be something as simple as a Band-Aid, but they're enrolled in that. And so uh, that can be one of the anchor industries for our county. That might happen through St. Mark's Hospital, which I'm so glad to have a hospital here. Or it might happen somewhere else. Uh, but there are ways we can get high-level health care here without it costing the, the 
taxpayers a lot of money, but that would cost the individuals a lot of money, and people that have no money whatsoever might still be able to get extremely high-level health care. We're not going to have St. Jude Hospital here tomorrow. We're not going to have something that large, but we can incrementally start and grow and grow and grow and, and do great things in our health care. Okay, first of all, the uh, St. Mark's. I was on the board when we decided to ask for the taxing district. Uh, it was a tough time. It was a tough time uh, for the hospital, for everyone that was on the board, uh, for everyone who supported it. Uh, it's, a, it's so necessary in this county and it is vital to the citizens. The next, the other part of the question. Uh, the hospital will, the hospital is here, I'm still, thank goodness, very, very thankful that that, that happened. Uh, and we need to protect that hospital and we need to make sure that that hospital is here for years to come and improving its quality and care <coughs> for our citizens. The, uh, your thoughts on the uh, uh, vote to create the hospital tax district a few years ago and then also the uh, tax increase that the county had in 2019. I was very pleased when the voters voted against that tax district. Um, government welfare is not charity. Charity requires free will. I would rather see private organizations raise funds. I would gladly donate money to the hospital. I would I love the hospital. But I'm not willing to fund the hospital on the back of, back of uh, on property taxes, which uh, make it harder and harder for me to enjoy my property in the government control. Okay, uh, this question is with uh, Craig. Last question. Another taxing question. On a micro level, Round Top has seen a huge increase in property values. It appears that on a micro level, this is happening all over Fayette County. What, could we, what do we do to those living on a fixed income who are seeing real estate prices skyrocketing right now? Thank you. I was really hoping there would be a whole lot more tax questions here. Uh, taxes is my, my passion. Uh, obviously, you can see it on my billboards. Uh, keep taxes low. Uh, and again, I'm going to repeat a common thing. We take incremental steps. I think property tax should be eliminated, period. I don't like property tax. It's a it's a socialist system, in my opinion, uh, but we can't just get rid of something tomorrow. So the first thing I would do is start with a little group. Anyone 90 or over, we're not paying property tax anymore. When we can do it to extend that, we'll go to 80 or over, we'll go to 70 or over until we can get rid of it. Uh, the sales tax that's coming in in Round Top in particular is astounding. If you look at the amount of sales tax that that small little 90 person community takes in, it, it, it competes with much, much larger towns. That's because they're doing some things the right way. Uh, bringing in a lot of sales tax is a way that we can eventually, over time, over a master plan, 5, 10, 20 year plan, uh, get to a place where our people don't have to worry that they're rinsing their home from the government instead of owning their home. There are people who have very beautiful homes who are completely paid off, who don't know if they're going to be able to stay in them because their property tax is so high. That has to be stopped. Uh, we can't stop it all tomorrow. God knows I wish we could, uh, but we can start with the 90 year olds and the 80 year olds and the 70 year olds till we get down to the 10 year olds and then 10 year olds will be paying a property tax again. Okay, for Lori, example is Round Top has seen a huge increase in property values. It appears this is happening all over Fayette County. What would you say to those living on a fixed income who are now seeing real estate prices skyrocketing? Well, I think we're talking about new construction in a lot of these instances. Uh, and that is priced well above homes that have been lived in for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I think maybe we ought to take a look possibly at uh, freezing the tax level uh, for and lowering the age that that can happen for your homestead. Uh, I think that as we look at it, our income tax uh, budget line item 
uh, has, is going to grow and it's going to keep growing. Okay, well, you, on, uh, for example, Roundtop has seen a huge increase in property values. It appears this is uh, happening all over Fayette County. What would you say to those people living on a fixed income who are now seeing real estate prices skyrocket? It's actually a problem that's uh, been around for a long, long time. And it's, it's large little businesses have a right to be there. Um, and the antique show has a right to exist. And it's unfortunate, you know, I'm one of the ones that is um, hurt by the increased property values. I don't like seeing property values increasing. I don't care if my house doubles in value. I frankly would rather stay low value. But um, I, I, these are going to be very difficult questions to, and, and issues to resolve. And a big part of it comes from monetary po policy at the national level. And so I'm not sure how county government can really affect that too much without restricting the movement of people and restricting subdivisions and restricting rights. Okay, for Dan, same question. We're on top of a huge increase in property values. It appears this is happening all over Fayette County. What would you say to those on a fixed income who are seeing real estate prices skyrocket? Well, I'm not sure that's a question for county government. Uh, property taxes, uh, the state takes care of that. We all remember Oh, 91, 92, somewhere around there, they told us if you pass the lottery, you're going to do away with the property taxes. Well, that's not true at all. As far as the value going up, it's going to continue to go up because, as I mentioned earlier, where we're located, people want to come to Fayette County. I don't have the answer to the question, but I do know it's a real problem. Property taxes are a problem, and it's not going to be solved in a uh, government of a local government area. Okay, that uh, concludes the uh, questions for you, and we'll open up with uh, your uh, two-minute closing remarks, starting with Lori. Well, first of all, I want to thank the, everyone who provided the setting for this today, all your hard work organization, getting it all together, emails, everything, uh, and also to our moder moderator. Uh, I, I know know that Fayette County has an amazing future ahead of it. I think we have to look at that growth that we've been talking about. I think we have to plan for the future. I think we have to plan our schools so they're not overwhelmed all at one time. I think we have to continue to uh, work together and unify the county. Um, liberty matters, the law matters, all authority in government comes from the citizens, and that authority is laid out in the Constitution, and the Constitution is both of them have been ignored for many years, and it's time that that stops. And it's never been more clear and evident that it needs to stop than in 2020. I have a lot at stake here, I have a lot of children in this county. I hope they stay here for many years. Uh, I believe I speak for the silent majority. I think there's a lot of people who have been keeping their heads down, working real hard, and being quiet. They've been intimidated and browbeaten, and that breaks my heart, and it's time for that to end. Um, I want to thank my wife and my children. Um, this has been a very difficult chore to run for office, and it's also very difficult for them, and um, without them I couldn't do it, and it's because of them that I do it. Thank you. Dan, you got your two minutes. All right, we, uh, I also want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, I think I'm the person to be the next county judge, and I don't say that bragging. I just think that I'm the person who knows the county best, and I know the people of the county. And uh, I just think that the county judge's position should be a reflection of the people. And in this election, I think I'm the best candidate that reflects the people of this county. I grew up here in Schulenburg and uh, make my home. My wife and I live in Swizzell. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very familiar with uh, county politics. I think a lot of people came here today knowing who you're going to vote for, and that's fine. When I was growing up here in Schulenburg, 
the only thing we had Republican-wise was here in Schulenburg, we had John Yarling and his father, also named John. We had Roy Buchek. We had uh, Terry's father over in Flatonia, Otto Steinhauser. And in Lorraine, we had Dr. Riley Jackson. The Republican Party was nobody ran on the Republican ticket. Even though we were always fiscal conservatives here in Fayette County. So thank y'all. If you came here undecided, I hope you vote for Dan Miller for county judge. If I'm elected, I pledge to do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, serving in my current role has been an absolute honor. Uh, being your chief of emergency management and homeland security has given me an, an insane amount of uh, ability to get out and touch people and see people and hear about uh, what they need and what they want. And, and it's just been awesome. And I really hope uh, that I can be your next Bay County judge. I think I've earned that vote. Uh, and if you are still undecided, I would like you to come talk to me and have a have a sit down and a chat. Uh, if you can't do that in person, I do have a Fayette County, uh, Craig Moreau for Fayette County Judge Facebook group. In that group, we're talking about things that are that are important to you. And not everybody in that group agrees with everything. There are people in that group that I'm sure that aren't going to vote for me, but I do want to hear what they have to say. No one on this stage has all the answers. No one in this county has all the answers. Uh, the answers come in the collective wisdom of, of the group. And these groups uh, they are able to give answers and give input are the reasons that we know what we know today. Uh, we have to go out and talk to stakeholders in this community, but we also have to talk to the people in this community who feel like they, their opinion hasn't been heard. Uh, some of those opinions are, are that are young. Uh, next Tuesday uh, at Latte on the Square from 5 to 6.30, I'm meeting with a large group of, of voters and nearly voters, 16 to 22 year olds, because that group is not involved by and large in what's going on. They need to know what's going on in their government. There's a whole lot of adults that don't know what the county judge does. There's a lot of kids that don't as well. If we can raise our kids right, get them involved in things, just like my daughter who's involved in the Fayette County Republican Women, uh, we can make this nation great. We can make this county great. Thank you so much for all your time. Uh, if you agree with any of my views, I'd love to hear it. If you disagree with any of my views, I'd love to hear it even more. And uh, thank you for being Fayette County residents, and uh, thank you for allowing me to.